Welcome to the Barbarian Hour podcast, where we conquer the impossible. The Barbarian Hour podcast is presented by Barbarian Apparel. Here is Jared Opfer and Zeb Miller. Are you ready? So Kevin Roberts, one of our newest partners here at the Barbarian Hour, Jared, he is selling Resolite mats. He's uh, gunning to be their top salesman of the year for Resolite out of Pennsylvania. And uh, he's out of the Pacific Northwest, out in North Idaho, uh, Eastern Washington. And he seems to be gaining momentum, and we've been working with him a lot. Uh, I'll be out there for camps later on at his new facility, the Dungeon. You've been working with him for years, right? Yeah, I've been working for, for Kevin for years. And then that was how Ian ended up at Oregon State is with uh, Coach Kevin Roberts. So you can check out Coach Roberts at robertswrestling.com. Nice, Coach. Can you give us a quick rundown on home use mats, how we contact Kevin Roberts for camps, and how we can get a hold of Kevin Roberts for home use mats and personalized Resolite mats from Kevin Roberts? Yeah. So I, thank you for mentioning that. I love being a Resolite rep, man. I love it. Great company, best mats in the business. If you ask me the gold standard. Um, so Roberts wrestling at outlook.com is my email. Roberts wrestling.com is my website, which has all my contact info on there. Follow me at Roberts wrestling on Instagram. Coach Bergman. First things first, where do you line up out of 14 kids? Where are you in the lineup? I'm, I'm the 12th of 14. So you're like the almost baby. Correct. Who is the two, who are the two bottom feeders below you? Uh, my sister, Kathy, and uh, my brother, Chris. So Chris and Kathy. Your wife is Kathy too, right? Correct. That's I don't how I think- remember. Yeah. <laughs> How do you keep track of 14? Oh, geez. Uh, it's just like you coaching your team. I mean, you know, you're with them every day. It's not that hard. <laughs> and then you got the kids and the that's kids. Right. And well, yeah. Don't, don't, yeah. We that's what I'm some grandkids my parents did. No, I, I'm not very good at that. Oh, geez. Jeez. What oh, is geez. the breakdown of boys and girls? We had eight boys and uh, six girls. So it came down to the last one. And uh, he was a boy, so boys prevail in our house. You almost had a 7-7 seven, seven split. Correct. Oh, wow. That's wild. Okay. Give me, first off, of your 14, are all 14 still alive? Uh, no. My brother, Hank, he was a Vietnam vet, and he died from leukemia at age 55, you know, probably mm-hmm. from age in orange, but, you know, we'll never know. And Hank was a state placer in either – was he wrestling and track? No, no. He, he played football, and he was the biggest one. He went to St. Saint, Saint Francis in Toledo and then okay. Xavier College. But, and then my oldest brother is Bill, and he passed away also. So there's 22 years difference between the baby and the oldest, the 14 oh kids. So now it is six boys and six girls that are alive. Correct. Okay. Two brothers have passed away, and the oldest, and then where was Hank? Was he second oldest? He was second oldest. So the oldest and the second oldest, who were boys, passed away that were Bergman's. Right. Okay. So now there's 12 of you left. Who is the oldest that is still alive? Is it a boy or a uh, Skip. He's, he's a doctor. He lives in Houston. Who's that? Um, he, he was – my dad's name was Eldo, and he was Eldo Jr., so probably for that reason – his nickname was Skip, and um, he uh, lives in Houston with his wife and kids, and he's, um, he's a doctor. Is he retired so, yet? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he still works, but um, he does a lot of different things with reading programs, like if you have dyslexia. He actually won a Jefferson Award, uh, which is handed out by the President of the United States for devising a a uh, computer program to help people with dys- dyslexia be able to read. Wow. wow. That's what Skip Bergman does. He is a doctor. Right. Uh, is he a psychologist? A well, psychiatrist? No, he was a pediatrician, okay. but he got off into this when one of his sons had dyslexia. Okay. So I guess my question's got to be, how, 
<laughs> He's dad, the smartest one. <laughs> your grandfather is Henry W., right? Correct. So Henry's your brother. Henry passed away, but Henry also, your grandfather, started the paving company. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. So 19, how do you get how do you get a doctor? How do you get a pediatrician out of a bunch of black topping pavers? How do you get that? I gotta know. I have no idea. <laughs> Doesn't make any you know, sense. If you have okay. 14 kids, you're bound to have one with brains. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the odds are, right? Odds are, right? Odds are. Right? Odds are. Okay. So my dad has a brother. Her head a lot. <laughs> you know, my dad has a brother that's a doctor. Did you know that? Right. Correct. How wild is that? A bunch of mouth breathing knuckle draggers. <laughs> and this one dude's a doctor. And then you got a bunch of mouth breathing knuckle draggers and a doctor. What doesn't make that? I don't understand. Where do these anomalies come from? But good for them, right? Right. They beat the odds. Oh my God. That's crazy. So, okay. So, okay. But it's, it's wild too. You guys are actually related. The Bergmans are actually related to one of the greatest women ten, tennis players of all time. Chris Everett is actually your first cousin. How is that? What? Yes. My, yes. My mom, His cousin's Chris Everett. Yes. <laughs> my never mom and, and her mom are sisters. And they grew up in New Rochelle, New York. As a matter of fact, my mom at one of the fundraisers had Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig come to their school for a fundraiser. Jeez. But, but no, so her sister, who was Clet, who was Chris Everett's mom, ended up marrying Jimmy Everett. He was the captain of the Notre Dame tennis team. And then he became a tennis pro at the public courts in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So they all grew up with a racket in their hands. Wow. Holy cow. I didn't know that. That's crazy. I love it. I love dropping knowledge bombs yeah. like that. Like, dude, that is insane. So how did, off, ahead, she's dude. won everything. Did she win every major, George? Oh, to yeah. your knowledge? She was number one in the world for like, you know, six, seven, eight years, something like that. And then she was right. But uh, her and never to probably. Right. That was a big part. rivalry. That is it's so 30, crazy. That's wow. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? So look, that that is his mom's side. That's not. She's not even a Bergman. That is the mom. So JD's second cousin, JD Bergman's second cousin, your nephew is Chris Everett. Right. So if we were smart. We would have never wrestled. <laughs> that's, what had, wrestling. that's what I was gonna ask. We how'd you get smart? So how'd you get into wrestling? It, it didn't go down the tennis path. How'd you end up with with wrestling? Um, well, with fourteen kids, you had to wrestle just to eat. It was natural, right? Yeah. No, but. Um, <laughs> My older brother, Joe, that was, uh, uh, he's one year older than Jim. He graduated in 71 and he got into wrestling. Uh, and then, you know, we've all been there. You go to the match, it's very intense and uh, gets near blood. You can't get it out. So everybody from Joe on down wrestled. So that would have been Joe. Um, and then Jim, who's, who's uh, JD's his dad, JD and Paul West. And then, uh, and Joe's kids were Bobby, who's the coach at, Genoa. I just saw them this Joey, weekend. Joey right? I saw both state, of them. Yeah. Right. Joey was a state qualifier for us. And then, um, and then there was John who was a year older than me. He was a state qualifier uh, for Stritch. That's where we went to school. And then there was me and then my brother, Chris, who was a state placer. So. And George, you were a state placer at Stritch too, right? Correct. Correct. And that was, that was when it was two, two divisions or three? Great question. I think I think I think it might have been three divisions, because um, I think didn't Jude Roth? He won the state what seventy eight. Seventy eight, right, 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 right. So yeah, they had three divisions because that was my senior year. So you took what place did you take in seventy eight? You took fourth. fourth, and they had six placers then. Right. Okay. So just follow it, your man. Just, the whole. I mean, it was nails, right? Because yeah, I mean, you had a right. Just to you get had to there. follow your man right. at districts too, right? Right. No room for error. Right. Wow. And Stritch, Stritch was the team, right, in Northwest Ohio back then, right? That was the team, right? Right. So right, I think six of the eight years in there, they were top six in the state. They're runner up uh, a couple of years. Like my brother, JD's dad's year, that would have been 72. They were runners up. Um, and, um, you know, like I said, they were in contention. Columbus to Sales is really good. Um, and, you know, there's some other powers in there, too. 
Hmm. Wow. So, so, George, of Northwest Ohio, the only teams to win titles in Northwest Ohio would be Toledo St. Francis under Doc Leffler. And then uh, it would have been Stritch, right? Delta, Stritch. Delta St. Mary's, and Genoa. Yeah, those are the only <laughs> Northwest Ohio teams ever to win it. Now, we could probably go back to maybe like DeVilvis, Maycumber, Toledo Scott in the 40s and 50s, and they might have been competitive. But then you had all the Cleveland John Haig, John Glenn, right. Cleveland right. West, the, t- the Cleveland West team, which uh, we had Charlie Augustino on. His grandfather was one of uh, – they had six state champs. The, the wow. Cleveland West teams well, had Matucci. six state champs. Yeah. Matucci was yeah. one of them, right? That was crazy when he told us that. And that was in the 40s. And I mean, yeah. but but Northwest Ohio, you know, it's it's been – Cleveland, Northeast Ohio has dominated, um, you know, wrestling at the in the OHSAA. There's no question. If you were to go back and do the percentages, they've probably won in all three divisions 90% of the state titles almost as team, 80 to 90% at least, right? That's crazy. George, was your dad, your dad was, where did your dad go to college? He went to the Naval Academy. So your and dad's he- a Naval Academy grad. Yeah, he graduated in 1940. His uh, class had the most uh, fatalities of any class ever at the Naval Academy because he graduated in 40 in, say, May or June. I think it was May. And then, of course, the war was in 41. In fact, um, my mom was at Pearl Harbor when the, when the Japs, Japanese bombed it. And my dad left the day before. Wow. So he was out to sea. And uh, my mom was there and she actually, uh, he told everybody to stay inside. She took a butcher knife and went to church thinking that, you know, if something happens to her, maybe she's, she'd be in a better place. But um, so she was there when they actually bombed. Did she oh, see the planes? Like- yes. She saw the insignia um, on the planes. Your mom saw the rising sun. She saw right. the Japanese rising sun. She was that close to it. Jeez. Well, I mean, she could recognize it. Yeah. That is in because nobody, it was the equivalent, George, would be 9 11. Nobody right. knew what was, it was like completely, like, you know, not to say it wasn't unprovoked completely, but it was about as unprovoked as it could be. Right. We, we had no idea. And we you know, obviously, they were trying to get rid of the Pacific Fleet. And wow, that, so your mom was there at Pearl Harbor. Correct. And your dad was out to sea, but there were no. He left the day before. Oh, my wow. goodness. So there were no. Um, okay, so there there was a fleet out because they they didn't weren't able to destroy it because our fleet, some of our fleet was out. And that was what actually saved us because your dad yeah. was out to sea already. Right. Wow. That's crazy. The Bergmans are thick with history, Jared. What do you think? Yeah, more than I can remember. <laughs> I, I Forrest Gump stuff. <laughs> That's crazy. Oh, my That's God. Crazy. That's so wild. So your mom literally saw the Japanese rising sun on the side of the plane bombing Pearl Harbor. That is wow. Well, and your mom, your dad's Aldo, and your mom was? Agnes was her name. Agnes. I remember they used to come to our dual meets. Right. They were at our dual meets. It was crazy. It was, it was just wow. I I did not know that your uh, that your mom was at Pearl Harbor when the Japanese attacked. Wow. So he was a Naval Academy grad. Was everything super regimented then, George? Uh, no. But I mean, uh, there wasn't open. We there wasn't anything open for debate. I mean, what he said was he ruled. You know. So and back then you ruled an iron fist. So if he told us to do something, we had to do it. So, so you did you have a nickname or do you have a nickname? You know, everyone always just called you Coach Coach Bergman and George, and then right, I think right. by fourteen you think you'd all have to have a nickname of some sort. No, we no. I, we really didn't have nicknames. Yeah, okay, yeah. all right. That's <laughs> I, yeah, I, I mean, I could only imagine the fights because I know the, how vicious the fights were in my family, but I can't imagine with fourteen, man. And I mean, did you have a sister? Were any of your sisters real bad units, like like total, just like? Um, I saw my sisters once in a while tell my mom, my mom would say, you're not wearing that out, what they're wearing. It was improper. And uh, sometimes they would disagree with her, and my dad would fly out of the room like Superman or Batman and <laughs> kind of lay down the law. So, I mean, uh, no, there wasn't. 
he ruled with an iron fist. So, and then, and then you had older brothers, like me being the 12th, you had older brothers that kept you in line if you got out of line. So. Is that, but but was your, all good. Who was yeah, your right. biggest rival, George? Who was your biggest, like, so obviously it was Tate and I, you know, obviously Jared and Drew were probably pretty rival, you know, the rivalry well, was Well, I mean, strong. I had a brother, was? John, a year ahead of me, but he was, you know, yeah, we could be rivals at time, but most of the time we got along pretty well. He was a lot bigger than me. So if you can't, you know how that goes, if you can't kick the guy's tail, you get along with him. <laughs> All right. So I've told the story before. I don't know if it's been on this podcast, uh, Jared, but uh, one day I was going to get in my Volkswagen Fox and we parked. I worked for the Birdmans in the summer. George was on the crew. Anyhow, I was walking to my car after a nice tough day of work, uh, you know, putting blacktop down. And John Bergman was weed whacking. And I said, hey, John, what's going on? How you doing? You weed whacking? Oh, well, yeah, yeah, I'm weed whacking. Yeah, I'm weed whacking. And I walked up, you know, to get to my car. And he hit me in the face with the weed whacker. And then he just started smacking me. And I was like, what are you doing? And I, like, <laughs> chucked him. I like as hard as I could, I just like formed him and chucked him away from me. And he came in at me again with the weed whacker and like threw it at me. And I'm like, what is this guy doing? What is happening right now? Uh, and, no, and listen, to my defense, normally I had something like that coming. You deserve this, it. This, this right. was completely unprovoked. And the dude just, he's slapping me with a weed whacker, like with the actual handle of it, like smacked me in the face with it, like hit me with it. And I'm like, what is going on? So one day John Bergman just beat me up in the yard. It was it was a good time. I was probably like a sophomore in high school, just got my driver's license. I'm like, what is happening right now? So you you probably deserved it, Zeb. You're, you're not <laughs> innocent. So, so coach, he's telling a story about Bergman. You got to have a, your favorite Miller story. You have any favorite oh. Miller stories that you can share <laughs> on air? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a great one. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, there was one. Um, in fact, uh, Zeb was involved. So uh, weightlifting, weightlifted in the morning before school. And Tate, who was his older brother, um, but he was smaller. And uh, they're weightlifting. And all of a sudden, they get into it. And who knows what it was about. I'm sure it was something really significant, like, you know, um, you know, world hunger, you know, something, <laughs> something like that, or somebody took a piece of gum, you know, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> that was one, that was one, <laughs> so anyway, that one the next thing, Tate is flying, I think he pushed off the bench press, and he's flying through the air, and I get in between them, and I'm catching Tate, like in a double leg, and of course, they're both swinging at each other, anyway, eventually, we all had to go to school, I had to teach at the, uh, elementary school and those two were there and they continue to fight and like pat kenya was there and, and oh, these guys and they're just showering and minding their own business and so tate goes to first period class he's got blood all over his shirt <laughs> and he stole yeah. all my clothes so, and the way it worked in O'Carver, you couldn't go to you couldn't go to school with shorts on so i couldn't wear my he stole all my clothes and like it got to like he got to like the second or third period of the day, and they're like, Tate, there's blood all over your back. Well, it was my blood. <laughs> and it was a marathon fight. We fought for like 20 minutes. And I'm bleeding all over him. And it and he only and then he tried to hit me with a weight. He tried to hit me with a 45 pound plate. They gotta show him, right? What'd he say? Oh yeah, he'll show me. Anyhow, um, <laughs> I had to, my sister had to bring me clothes. Cause he wouldn't give me my clothes. I, 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 cause you couldn't go to school. I had to like sit in the locker room. So my sister brought me clothes. And then there was the other time George used to come pick us up in the morning and we got in a fight over gum. And I remember George had like this, dude, you have like a, you have like a, a Pontiac, right? George, it was like a, a blue Pontiac, wasn't it? I think so. It was a blue Pontiac and he would draw, he came out and he, <laughs> he picked us up. We're fighting and Tate was in the back. Tate was in the back seat. I think I was in the front seat. And we're going down Nissan Road, our country road. And we got these big, huge ditches, like a ditch that'll swallow an 18 wheeler. And I remember we get like a half mile down the road, and George like loses his mind. He slams on the brakes, goes into the grass, and could have gone in the ditch, didn't. And I remember we were fighting over gum. 
And I remember he had a pack of gum in his, his ashtray and he pulls the pack of gum out and he rips it in half. He throws half of it at me, throws half of it at him. He goes, is good. Is that good enough for you too? All right, let's go to lifting. And he, <laughs> that was usually what the fights were over. Uh, anything to fight Just about. That's how it works. Nonsense. So- Just fights over nothing. So did you coach all four of the brothers? Did you coach Ferd too? Or what? I was in the chair when Ferd won, but my brother was the head coach. Oh, wow. And then so. I was in the chair when Chad won his, but my brother was in the head coach. And then Tate was my first state champ as a head coach. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, I have another story, though. Okay. Our wrestling room was right off the gym. And anytime you wanted to have a little more intensity in practice, you just have Zeb and Tate wrestle. So it's like two cats in an alley. So the doors open right to the gym floor. So they're wrestling. They hit those doors and they end up on the gym floor. And the basketball coach stops practice. He goes, that's intensity. That's what we need out here on the basketball court. It was Steve Keller. Right. It was his, it his son Keller. is the head coach at Margareta. Yeah. yeah so, right. Yeah. So – Actually, I think he probably they were you guys were trying to break us up because he got me on skates and I was going backwards and I I remember there was those doors that was like these and I remember hitting them and I did a backflip and I came up and I hit him in the face and then it was just by you, know, you and Scott Zeitzheim were flying and by and I remember Steve Keller they were scrimmaging someone it was in the middle of a <laughs> scrimmage. And he's like, you see that? That's the intensity I want. He's like frothing and spitting. And I think the dudes are all like, yeah, these guys are nuts, though. What are you talking about? They're like out of their minds. This guy, the other guy, I mean. They probably see you all day, right? Yeah, they're probably like, you don't know these guys. There's something wrong with them. But, yeah, he, like, loved it. He thought it was intense. And, yeah, that's what I want. And, I mean, it is what you want to a degree, but not (laughs) – Maybe not, maybe not that much. I don't know, but yeah, there's so many of those. Oh, uh, okay, all right. So I remember when we came home one day from working with George, he would pick us up before Tate had a license. Picked us up all day. Tate harassed him all day. They would steal cookies from one another. They would steal. One time, Tate walked like five or six miles back from a job because George stole his cookies because he George stole George's cookies first. So one day we came home and I remember it was awesome. George, you probably wouldn't be able to do this today, but he came home and my dad was in uh, in our front room and they was like eating dinner. It was probably five or six o'clock, and he comes in and, and my dad's like, "Hey guys, how was work today? Oh, it's good." Tate, mind you, like a sophomore, junior in high school, he goes, it was good, but George is a slug. He didn't do anything. And I remember George punched him right in the clavicle and then mounted him, st- stood on top of him. My dad's like, hey, you shouldn't run your mouth. And George maybe gave him a smack or two. But uh, I don't think you'd get away with that one today, George. What do you think? No. Unless it's Tate. Tate always deserves no. it, right? Yeah. Yeah, if it was Tate, I'd probably get some kind of Medal of Honor from the superintendent. <laughs> Accommodation. <laughs> Do you remember that, George? When he ran his mouth, you punched him right in front of my dad. Yeah. That was awesome. You punched him right in the collarbone. What well, probably wasn't the first and wasn't the last. Right? Oh, he, he got punched. He deserves everything he gets. I don't know how you coach the guy. First off, if this was this is a testament to George. The guy was sick when he was a senior in high school. He had a torn ACL. He got really bad food poisoning. He quit every day. I thought I quit. Which quit every day as a junior. Scott Dietra used to just kick the tar out I, of everybody. I think he quit at the Panther Classic one year. He, no, he think. quit at the SBC. Is that what it was? George, yeah. has that ever happened to you since? Have you ever had a defending state champ walk off the mat as he's mopping another guy up? What, was it at St. Mary's, though? Was it, it was at St. Mary's? Mary's. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, that's yeah. what I'm thinking of then. Tate, okay. Tate didn't have a lot of mat savvy. He'd just go 100 mile an hour, and it worked when he could train. When he couldn't train, all the petrol was out. When it was out, he walked <laughs> off the mat a couple of times. So we had to teach him to brawl, and you know, then his stamina came back, and he got a little bit better as the year went on. But yeah, didn't he have like mono or something or something going yeah, on? Yeah, mono. Was, uh, food. Yeah, yeah, food yeah. poisoning. Okay. okay. He had mono. He had all this crazy stuff happen to him, and all in this like this real short um, period, a real short window, like a December January window. 
and he just, yeah, I mean, I, but George, what was, what's that like when an athlete just walks off the mat, like a high level athlete walks off the mat? Well, but like? you, you understood the, the individual, you know, like I said, he, he didn't have a lot of mat savvy and he would go a mile a minute. And when he was in shape, that, that meant a win. But when, when he wasn't in shape because of, you know, those illnesses, then he ran out of gas and, you know, he didn't know how to pace himself. But he developed it. He got it at the end of the year, made it through the state. Wild stuff. I mean, but, you know, like you're saying, he's your first state champ. You guys have, like, I just looked at the program. You have, like, 24 state champs at Ocarp. And you, most of those are under you. Over half of those are under you. What is the secret to success to training guys? Your last one, I think, was your last one, Dylan Thorpe? Correct. So what's the key? What's the key ingredient? To and you guys, I think, have been runner up under you what twice, two or three times. Two, two. Well, there should have been that one time, and then your nephew's team swiped it away from you at the at the last second, right? Yeah, they had a great finals, and yeah, uh, they did. And they a were great third, so they were runner up that year, and then they broke all the records the next two years. Genoa, right? And Bob, right. And Bob your nephew's the head coach at Genoa. But right. what's the key to su- uh, to success and consistency, George? Uh, I mean, we're lucky. We have a great clientele here at Oak Harbor. And, and uh, the tradition was here long before I got here. Um, you know, like 1980, I think they're runners up with Hector Gonzalez. And then Denny Kirsten did a nice job before that. Um, so, I mean, the, again, tradition helps a lot. A lot of these, some of these kids I'm, you know, coaching this year, they're, you know, second generation. So when you have that tradition, that's huge. And then they have a good work ethic and um, their commitment to the sport. So that helps tremendously. Yeah, you guys, you guys have been uh, consistent as, as, as they come in Northwest Ohio, across the state, really. And, um, you know, you mentioned some names there. Um, who, who else are some of the guys that have been part of that program, you know, day in, day out? I mean, you guys been – doing it forever and you know what you're going to run up against when you wrestle no carver right you're you're going to you're going to find a guy that can brawl and go after you and he's not going to back down right right i mean we've been fortunate to have kids uh, that go right to that i mean that's their style so um you know obviously we try to fine tune them but like i said the the tradition and all helps tremendously wrestling is important in O'Carver, and you know um, so we're fortunate in that aspect and you guys kind of, you know, a couple of those years were on the bubble to be D3. If you were D3, you guys would have brought home the title, right? The, the two times that I was fortunate enough to be runner-up, uh, St. Paris Graham were, was national champs. So, <laughs> you know, and you tough, guys, to, tough to beat that. And you guys were a few number, I mean, a few, you know, enrollment, a few boys away from D and D, D3, right? Now you're D3. Right, right. I mean, you talk about a. You know, running up against St. Paris Graham when they're winning D1, you know, they, they're winning whatever division they're in, right? Whatever right. whatever state they're in. Right. And here you guys are, you know. Yeah, that's pretty wild. That's pretty wild. Little old Carver, you know, year in, year out for, for how many years? The hard work and ethic, you know, the, the ethic, hard work um, background you guys have, where, where do you credit that to, I guess, when you come in? You said it was a tradition, but, you know, where did that start and where did you kind of learn your coaching ropes from? Um, I was fortunate at Stritch. I had Tom Talbot. He's in the Hall of Fame. Uh, in fact, he was at Huron before Stritch. Oh, really? Okay. And Huron was runner-up in 1971. They actually had three state champs that year. It was uh, Gunlatch, Delameter, and McGraw. Right. And right. Uh, Stritch, Stritch knocked him off and beat two of those guys at Districts. And Tom Talbot and those – uh, three individuals turned it around the next week. I mean, obviously nobody touched Delameter. He was a two-time state champ, uh, but the other two, the stretch wrestlers knocked him off the week before and they turned the tables. And I think Shannon might have been on that team too. So uh, he might have taken a six, but anyway, they were runners up then. And uh, Tom Talbot came to, to stretch and uh, he was a good, obviously an outstanding coach. And he was runners up uh, two or three times, maybe even three times maybe twice. I'm, I forget. Wow. But anyway, um, so he was an outstanding coach. So uh, that was some of the background. And then, 
obviously wrestling in college, you know, I, I tell any of my kids, I'm talking about kids going through our program. Some of them want to coach. I say, if you want to coach, you know, compete in that sport in college, you'll have a PhD in wrestling by the time you get out. So um, obviously I think, you know, wrestling in college really helps. And uh, my assistants like Bill Scherf, he wrestled at Finley, um, Zeitzheim wrestled at John Carroll, um, Aaron Bomer wrestled at Heidelberg, you know, Paul Bergman, who I have now wrestled at Mercyhurst. So, and they all bring in, you know, something a little bit different, you know, so to, to help the program. Yeah, it's amazing. You guys, you know, Zeb and I talked on a previous show of how many guys you've put at the college level, you know, from a small Oak Harbor school, the, the amount of kids you put at all levels of colleges. It's just amazing. It's pretty wild. The other thing is, you know, you've had an NCAA champion in Division II, an NCAA finalist in Division I, a couple three-time All-Americans. You've had some really, really, really good individuals. You've had years where you've had the best guy in the state of Ohio, I mean, arguably, Obviously, if you look at JD and you look at Ian, I mean, those guys are incredible. And then Kramer wins the NCAA title for for Ashland. I mean, you've had some really Cody Cody Magan was Cody Magan was pretty phenomenal too. I mean, four time state placer, three time state champ, and then he was captain at Ohio State uh, two years. I think it was so. Um, yeah, we've been very fortunate to have kids go through our program that were outstanding, you know, good athletes. Um, you know, one of the things that doesn't come up, but that I'm real proud of is to have two that graduate from the service academies, you know, Connor Witt from the air force Academy and my own son, Alex at the Naval Academy. And, um, obviously to go to one of the academies and, and, uh, do a sport and get the grades, it takes a special individual and then to serve our country, which they're both serving right now. So pretty neat. Where's Alex right now? And where's Connor? Uh, Connor, I'm not sure. He might be in Florida. Uh, he's an in intelligence in the, in the air force. And then Alex is over in. Uh, he's on a ship somewhere in the sea of Japan or in that area. So he was wow. at Okinawa, but he's on a ship now, an amphibious ship. Wow. So he <laughs> is out to sea. And I'm guessing they're patrolling to seeing what China is doing right now would be my only guess on that. And Connor is an intelligence. Connor Witt is an intelligence. Well, listen, I'm going to tell you this right now. <laughs> you have told me Connor Witt was going to be an Academy grad, Army, Navy, Air Force. I would have eaten my hat. I would have taken my hat and not put any syrup or ketchup or anything on it. I would have eaten it. I would have taken a, a, a knife and a fork and eaten it. And I had a laugh at you the whole time. I would have been like, there's no way this dude's out of control. He is unhinged completely. I, 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 I would have said, I don't know him like you guys know him, but uh, he came down to my brother Troy's. You know, Troy and uh, Keith are pretty close, obviously. And he showed up at uh, Troy's bachelor party. And yeah, he, he'd been the last, last, last one that I'd guess <laughs> be doing that. <laughs> they call him the convict. Literally, that's his nickname, nickname, is it not, George? The convict. Yeah, he he's definitely one of the toughest, mentally toughest kids I've, I've coached. I mean, um, you know, one thing about it, we have ropes in our room. He climbed up and down the rope like 24 times in a row. I mean, who does that? Right. You know? <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, so, well, I, I think Keith's probably his dad had to do it. But Keith's chasing him up matter. there, right? He, it, Keith can't crawl you know, <laughs> I mean, even if you stop for a break, <laughs> how do you do it? You know? Right. It's unreal. Oh, it's unreal. The it's guys probably have... a 20-foot rope, you know. Oh, geez. Okay, so between Magrum, between J.D. Bergman, Ian Miller, between, uh, you know, Luke and Jake Kramer, both D2 All-Americans. You, you, J.D.'s a multiple-time world team member for the United States of America. Between all those really good guys you've had. Between all those guys who like, I'm sure you can find, well, this guy's the most talented. This guy is the most, you know, uh, stone cold ice in his veins wins when it counts. Who, who, how do you rate those guys and how do they stack up? You know, you're putting together an all time team. I mean, those guys got to be in your starting lineup, right? Right. Right. They'd all be my starting lineup. Probably my Mount Rushmore would be, you know, Cody Magrum, 
uh, JD and, and Ian, you know, not in any particular order, but uh, for what those guys did in high school uh, and in college, you know, um, I mean, Cody, uh, as a freshman at 160 to place in state, that's pretty special. And then right. we went it three years in a row. We've never had a three-time state champ. Um, and then, you know, for what JD did, uh, JD, I think, won his last, you know, 80-some matches. Um, his senior year, he didn't get taken down. I mean, I didn't know that until the state finals was over. He didn't get taken down. So, um and then for what he did in college. And then Ian, um, if you look at our record board, he has almost every record by 10%. I mean, you know, I think Ian and Ian and JD were just freaks, you know, I mean, just That's they pick you say. up and throw you for distance, <laughs> you know, they yeah. pick you up, you know, just, I think, I think sometimes the good Lord makes somebody, and there's a specific reason why he made him. When he made those two guys, he made freaks. You know, and he made them. Made, those guys took to wrestling like a fish to water. You know, it's crazy because then if you look at your second tier guys, you got Greg Goad. Your second tier all time greats: Greg Goad, Carlos Menchov, uh, Blay. Right. Right. I mean, what Blay, I was Bird, is my brother I Bird. Right. right. I mean, I, I know you didn't coach yeah. those guys, but like if you're looking at your Mount Rushmore. Look well, Mount guys. Rushmore, you'd have to throw Goad on there. And, and, you know, Ferd would be very, very close. You know, I mean, he was very special. So, but I didn't, I was just talking about the kids that, that I coached. I know. mean, that's just, but that, I think, like you said, the tradition was there when you right. got there and you really took the ball and ran with it. You know, Carlos, then, Carlos Minchef and uh, Rob Houston, two-time state champs. Those were incredible athletes. I mean, um, O'Carver's had some incredible athletes. One of the Blazers you know. is a four-time state placer, I believe. Correct. I think he took six four times. I don't think I'm making that up. That's that, but I don't care. That's really hard to do, man. Right. It's really hard right. to be good. And that was like he did that in the 70s and the early 80s. Right. right. He didn't have freshman state placers. It was it was kind of unheard of in the late 70s. So yeah, they, they've, did, they've had some really – you guys have had some really good teams. And, not, and, you know, not just George Bergman teams, but, man, you, you've had some really talented guys. What does it take to make a community care about a sport like they, they care about a sport like wrestling at Oak Harbor? Um, I mean, I think it had to start somewhere. I think it started with Denny Kirsten getting it going um, and really getting Oak Harbor good. And then uh, Hector Gonzalez followed, and he had that – great team in the eighties with the men chefs and the blaze. And they were it with Phil Wyrick and he, they ended up second in the state. And then it just continued with my brother. And, and uh, so, I mean, that tradition, when you have a good program year after year after year um, and you get the fans excited, they want to come out and watch. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you had Ohio state, how many Ohio state duels have you had at Oak Harbor? One or two? You mean the regionals? Or? No, Ohio State. The Ohio State University, University. has come and wrestled oh, one, in your gym. Was one. it once that or was, twice? Uh, Cody, Cody Magrum, senior year when they wrestled Illinois. That's and Drew, cool. Drew uh, Stone wrestled then, too. Correct. Wow. I that's forgot crazy. About Stone. Yeah, I forgot he, was, he wrestled there. That's right. Yeah, it's a two-time state runner-up. Right, right. Pretty exactly. good. We're, Pretty we're, good. We're naming all these names and, like, you know, you, I, not, you know, like I said, I don't have the – the mind like Zeb, but some of these wrestlers. No one does. Right, no. Uh, but you have a two-time state runner-up. You forget, man, you know, you have another guy that wrestled Ohio State. You know, it's like, you know, like I said. They've had guys, man. Yeah. They've done a really good job. Right. George is a really good guy. You know, and here's the biggest thing I, you know, I noticed. My workload when I went to Kent State was less. Mm -hmm. My workload was less. You, you so mentioned it was that. like I went in yeah. mm -hmm. and – the morning workouts were not like morning workouts at Oak Harbor. Georgia's consistent like clockwork. It's always Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Like I can literally say what the workouts are and it's probably the same thing. And I graduated in 98. It's probably a very similar recipe and it's just a consistency thing. And it's a lot of time, putting a lot of time into it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're going to beat a lot of people in wrestling. If you put, if you, I mean, if you go and you're going to do, and you're going to slack and you're not going to put the effort in, Sure, you're not going to be very good. But if you go there, your coach is working out. Your coach is lifting with you. 
Now I'm guessing his joints are probably slightly worn out. So he probably rides the bike while they, while they lift, or he does some type of maintenance. I, am I making this up or am I probably right? You still hit the shoe in pretty hard, right? Yeah, no, he's, you're, you're right. The joints are probably look like your elbows and your shoulders. You're probably not lifting weights like you were. And then I remember as a freshman, you know, 94, 95, you would still drill with me after practice. And then that was the last year for that. You After 94, 95, you didn't drill anymore. You didn't drill anymore or do anything. Do you remember that? Uh, I remember working with you. Yeah, I remember laying down and having uh, Tate do a barm on the right side, then a barm on the left side, barm on the right side. Yeah. Yeah, so, but like, as far as when you have that, though, I guess my point is when you have that, your coach is doing everything alongside you, and then he goes and he teaches all day, and then he comes back and coaches you. It's kind of like, why, if this guy can do it, why can't I do it at a high intensity level? I, I mean, I never really thought about it that way, but now that I look at it as an educator and, you know, someone who coached for, you know, five plus years, I look at it that way. I'm like, man, you know, it's, it's hard to, a lot of coaches aren't doing what you're doing. And that's, that's actually, that's awesome. How many, how many joints have been replaced? Uh, just both knees. Oh, just, just, is that just two, just two knees? <laughs> right. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> uh, I mean, my shoulders are still good. Are they? Good. Oh, those Which shoulders is surprising because most of my career I was arching off my back. So I, I think my shoulders be bad. But Sh- still shoulder and neck is not good. <laughs> it's crazy. But, but like, so now you've always had like camps that you've attached to. Jordan's is one of the camps you guys have gone to. You're consistent with the off season training. You guys have done Disney duels. Fargo, you've done all your guy. There's just nowhere to hide in the program if you want to get by. There's just nowhere to hide. It's just, it's, it's full steam ahead. And if you're there, you know, like now I live obviously in a metropolitan area that's just way different. Now that I look at back at it, I'm like, man, I lived in the middle of a field that sucked. There was nothing to do. I went out and ran and I did like, I just did stuff. You know what I mean? Like you look back at it now, there's so much for my kids to do now, right? Like you don't even have to leave the house anymore, but that's obviously the worst thing you can do. That's part of the problem with what's going on right now. But like, I look back at it. I'm like, man, there just wasn't much to do. There wasn't much to do around there. So it's like you threw yourself into your training. Right. And uh, that's what I appreciate about it. And I like that. I like that. You know what a lot of these programs have done, like a claim on has done. Right. I like what Oak Harbor's done. I like what Delta's done. I like what a lot of these public schools have done when they just, they get a family and they, they get, they, they ride that family pretty hard. The Peters is at Claymont, right? My family, your family at Oak Harbor, right, George? Right. It's, it's, I think it's pretty incredible. The Maddens and the Centobans at Delta, right? The, the Rayfields. I mean, you just got these families that the uppers at St. Mary's there. You go. I mean, you know, I was going there, but they don't count because they're a private school. Whoa, burn, 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 burn. Hey, I went to stretch. That's a private school. I know you guys are all Catholic guys. I got to watch what I say around you. I'm like, I got to watch my back now. Next place I go, uh, George. So when you look at the workload, right. I knew like, I, whenever I was going to college, it was going to be, Oh man, I hope I can make this jump. And I remember you were like, you're going to make the jump easy, man. We already run you through like, this is like a division one program. How did you get, you know, is that something that you got at the university of Toledo? Where did you get the idea to run your small farm town, nuclear power plant school, public school to run it like a, a division one, two or three uh, wrestling program in the NCAAs? Um. I mean, it's just, you know, hopefully if the kids go through the program, they learn a, a commitment, they learn a work ethic, you know, and they're accountable, you know. So um, if you want to get better at something, you know, the old 10,000 hour rule, if you put 10,000 10, hours in, in it and it's concentrated, um, you're focused, you know, you can get good at something. So, um, you know, we have a short time, you know, because the season – is so many months and we we're working a lot of times with kids are in two to three sports like Zeb, you were in three sports, you know? So the only time I'm really with you a hundred percent is during the season. So we're trying to get everything we can out of you. And, you know, sometimes you get, a, you need to get a drill in because you're lacking in this, 
this technique or sometimes you need to get a lift in because you need to get a little stronger. So we just try to provide the uh, vehicle for success. And if they jump on it and they uh, buy into it, then you have something that could be something pretty special. We've, we've uh, had a few times we talked and you, people uh, ask you, say, when you're going to be done, you say, when I'm not having fun anymore. Right. That's kind right. of right? right. I guess, right. how do you measure that? Right. Cause coaching, it's fun, but sometimes I deal with these knuckleheads, you know? Right. I, I tell you, um, you know, each each team has its kind of own personality. And, you know, I've had rough years like like anybody else. But the great thing about wrestling is there's usually a couple of kids that just jump right out and get after it. And that makes it a lot of fun. And now if it's a whole team, uh, the team I have this year, um, they're just great kids. I mean, they're fun to be around. Um you know, they work hard, they're, they're focused. I mean, so, um, like I said, as long as it's fun, um, I think one thing that COVID has showed us is that when you're home all day, there's only so many Netflix programs you can watch, you know, after a while you're like bored. I'm not ready to retire. When we're home during COVID. I think that's one thing that some of us found out that Mm -hmm. we're not quite ready to retire. I mean, the soap operas aren't that good. You know, (laughs) The same story. <laughs> right, oh, right, right. Uh, well, I think I might have seen you in some TikTok videos over COVID. I'm not going <laughs> to lie to you. I'm not going to lie. I wasn't going to bring it up, but, you know, I mean, you know, it, it, it hey, just kind When you have a daughter, they'll have you do crazy things. You know, Jared should know. I'm, I'm sure learning. he's done some crazy I'm le- things. I'm old learning, girl dads. I'm learning real quick. Learning real <laughs> quick. Speaking George, of- George, yeah. being a uh, – okay, so you had – listen – the most amazing thing I've ever seen was you had three sons, right? And I remember like being there, them being born, you know, you were my coach, you coached all my brothers. And I remember like, man, he kept having boys. What was it like when you guys finally had a girl? What was that like? Cause your wife, I've never seen a woman who wanted to have a daughter so bad. And then, and then I might, I remember your wife, she wanted a daughter so bad. And then you guys finally had a girl. What's, what's it like? raising boys to girls? Um, I mean, totally different, but, um, you know, my boys were a blast. I mean, I'm glad I had the three. Um, And just, I think every dad wants to have a son that he can do things with and share his passions with. And all three of them are are, um, unbelievable. Um, My daughter obviously was was, uh, unique and she grew up being the fourth one. we had mats in our basement and if she went down there, sometimes when she came up, there were a lot of tears in her eyes, you know, the boys kind of helped make her tough, you know? And so uh, she was a pleasure to be around. Um, She ended up playing softball in college and uh, majoring in chemistry and biology and graduating in three years. And she just got accepted this year uh, to Ohio state dentistry school. So she'd be going to dental school in this, this August or September. So, um, but she was great. I mean, she has a three point record at the high school. She made eight in one game. Uh, she played three sports. And I think just having three older brothers that were wrestlers uh, made her tough. And she was actually in the weight room with me, you know, just like the boys were starting in about fifth grade. She was in the weight room three days a week with me in the morning. So um, she, she's been great. I mean, I, I think uh, if you have a boy and a girl, it, it just makes a complete family. So I, I was blessed to have both. That's awesome. What are the other three? Okay, we know we got a Naval Academy grad with Alex. Yeah, the other two graduate from Ohio State, and uh, they're living in Columbus, working in Columbus, and uh, they're marketing majors, and uh, they're doing it. They have great jobs down there, and um, she'll be going to Ohio State dental school which we'll put here down there and she graduated from ohio dominican which is down in columbus so that was a nice thing that she could go to college 10 minutes away from ohio state um and and how can't you not love columbus and and ohio state i mean it's awesome when are you moving to columbus well that's a great question (laughs) i think we're trying to get uh alex someday maybe he can uh move to columbus and work and then definitely mom and i would would follow so kathy's parents are in Cary. Uh, we're not going anywhere as long as they're in Cary, and uh, but definitely one day if all our kids are down there, we'll 
definitely moved down there probably. Okay, so how long have you been the head coach at Oak Harbor? Uh, this is my 29th year as the head coach. So 29 years, how many years to, for you're done, uh, before you're done with teaching? Uh, this is my 35th year teaching. Uh, but, you know, I'll, I'll give you the same answer that I told you <laughs> all along. You know, as long as it's fun, as long as I don't dread getting up in the morning and doing it, you know, I'll keep doing it. As long as my health is good. You know, it's when, fun. Do you start, when do you start grooming a, uh, an assistant? Uh, immediately, if not sooner. <laughs> <laughs> so it's already in the works. Right. Uh, already in the works. Well, I mean, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. I mean, uh, Trevor Scherf and Dylan uh, Manzer, both state placers for us, graduate. And uh, Trevor wrestled at Baldwin Wallace and Dylan's wrestling right now at Tiffin. Uh, but again, we'd love to get somebody in the system because I think it's tough to be the head coach and not be in the system. But Paul, you know, I, Paul, I'd like to st- correct. Thank you, nephew Paul. Right, right. And Paul is running the, the family business with his dad. So, I mean, um, but we need somebody that's a teacher. And, you know, I think those two would be perfect candidates if, if, if they were so inclined and fortunate to get into the, to our school system. That's awesome. Okay, so we talk about how you've got the JDs and the Ians, right? Just mutants that are Freaks, that right. can just do like things that nobody else can do. Um, you got all these guys, right? You, you've got you've got the free. You've got a spectrum, man. Like it is like the most diverse spectrum of athletes I think I've ever seen, right? Who's your toughest guy ever? Who is just like, man, this guy is tough, and he don't he won't give up, and he's just off just the grittiest mean like that you've had the scott detray's probably the meanest guy scott detray i ever saw who's the toughest grittiest guy you've ever had at oak Harbor? i mean that's a great question because um you know even those guys that we mentioned that were mutants um you know freshman year they they ran into some tussles and and struggled um you know that's the thing with wrestling uh you know we've all gone through it we've all struggled until we've figured it out or, or, uh, you know, gotten confident and, uh, had success. So, um, I mean, I've had a lot of tough guys and say who the toughest one ever is, is I think I'd be doing an injustice to a lot of the guys. I mean, they're all, uh, tough at one time or another, but, um, even those great ones we talked about had a chink in the armor when they were freshmen, uh, you know, they all had their vulnerable spots, whether it be in a practice or in a match, you know, and again, um, you know, the, the opponent that was going against them had to be pretty doggone tough, you know, to make them vulnerable. But uh, in Ohio, you don't have to look very far to find them. They're around every corner. You mentioned, um, you know, some of the, the studs you have on the team, um, you know, and you mentioned, you know, learning, you know, freshman, you know, learning. Is there anything you learned uh, as, as you know, you mentioned, you know, with this COVID, you know, you can only watch so much in Netflix, you know, you've been coaching for, like you said, 29 years, teaching 35, anything you've learned with this whole COVID this year. And I mean, we're closing in here, you know, post season's approaching, you know, but, uh, anything you've learned or kind of your, yes, your take I mean, on I, I've learned to be flexible and to be, uh, and, and I don't know if I exactly learned that as, you know, when you're 12th in the family of 14, mm. you had to learn to be flexible. Right, right. I kind of went where everybody else went. I mean, I couldn't say, hey, Dad, uh, (laughs) we're heading to Frisch's. I want to go over here to Burger King, you Mm -hmm. know. (laughs) I was going wherever everybody else went. So, you know, I tended to be kind of flexible anyway. But with the COVID, I mean, I I also coached middle school football, eighth grade football, seventh grade football. You know, blew my mind that we could be competing and Ohio State wasn't. Uh, Mm -hmm. The MAC wasn't. The Big Ten wasn't. Um, but there were certain times that you had to back off or you had to change the way that you normally did things because of COVID. And, and we've done the, the same thing in wrestling. So you've learned to roll with the punches. Um, I'm just so happy that we're out there competing and that, um, you know, you think when COVID started and everything shut down, when you turned on TV, you couldn't find a sporting event. Mm-hmm. I mean, be able to, to uh, watch wrestling on the Big Ten Network, to be able to watch NFL and college football, to be able to, you know, to go coach, even though there's nobody in the stands, 
you're watching kids compete. I mean, that's awesome. You know I mean? I, you, you got to help and love it. You know what I mean? So uh, you just learn to be a little bit more flexible. Right. Hey George, with the the multi sport athlete, that's always something like you know you coach uh, seventh eighth grade football, seventh grade football, junior high football. Is it has it always been seventh grade? Uh, no, I went to eighth grade this past year. I went to seventh grade next year. I'll be at eighth grade. Got it. Okay, so you know you've always been a big believer in multi sport athletes, and we're getting towards a lot of specialization. I can tell the community where you guys, I know the community where you are, most of the kids are, are multi-sport athletes. Very rarely do you have a kid who's just doing one sport. Why is being a multi-sport athlete such an important thing? Why do you preach it? Obviously, if you're on the coaching staff, you're at the varsity football games or you're scouting, you're always doing something. Why? And you've had so many crossovers with all state football players and all state wrestlers. It's just you know, Nick Turbin was a state placer for you, Pat Kenya, your nephew, JD, my brother, Ferd. I mean, that's just off the top of my head. And I know there's more than that, right? Guys who wrestled that were all state football players, right? Are all state football players and all state wrestlers. You've got a ton of them. Why is that something that you, you guys do so much? Why are you so into multiple sports? And what do you think of specialization? Um, I mean, I would encourage any kid to do multiple sports. Um, you know, one reason uh, one thing that I've seen is that they tend to be more coachable. You know, when I play football, I'm accountable to the head coach. I'm accountable to my position coach and they all want maybe something different out of me. When I go to wrestling, there's a different personality. So uh, when you're doing multiple sports and then like with Zeb, you did track, there's also another coach and they're all teaching you different techniques, uh, different uh, ways to improve. And you have to be coachable. I, I, tell all my athletes two things that I think every athlete wants to hear. One is that he's coachable. And the second is that he's tough. And if you're tough and you're coachable, you'll go a long way. Um, a lot of the sports you're learning, uh, you're working different parts of your body with football and wrestling. They go hand in hand, the toughness and the lifting aspect. Uh, you lift a lot for football. Also the lifting and strength will help you in wrestling. Um, you know, when you, when you can wrestle and, and you have a good leg attack, that's going to go right over the football arena and help you become a better tackler as a linebacker, as a corner, as a defensive lineman. Defensive lineman, you're doing a lot of hand fighting. And also as an upper weight, you're doing hand fighting. So um, there's a lot of, of, of carryover from one sport to the other. I noticed that they're more coachable. I think sometimes when you're specializing – you're specializing and you're listening maybe to one person, whether it be that, that coach that you go to the private coach, or it might be a parent. And then all of a sudden, when you get up into high school, uh, maybe your high school coach has a different philosophy, maybe showing you different techniques. And some of those kids have a tough time um, listening to the head coach and they might be going off what their dad said. They might be going off, of what their specialization coach said. And uh, both can be helped. I always tell them all the time, you can learn from Zeb Miller. You can learn from Jared Upfer. You can learn from, you know, uh, any other coach, you know, whether it be, you know, Moran who is around, Jeff Jordan, Mitch Clark camp, you know, whichever camps you're going to, they all have great technique. And uh, it's not just one person that, that knows the sport. So I think you're more coachable when you're, 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 you're doing multiple sports and then the carryover and the athleticism things that you learn. That's awesome. That, that's a hundred percent true. Have you coached other sports or has it always been football and wrestling? Um, I, I don't want to do anything injustice. So, mm. I mean, I, I did football and wrestling in high school and, and, and wrestle in college. So, um, you know, I feel like I can offer something in those two sports and I wouldn't want to just, coach for the, you know, the check or whatever you want to call it in another sport. I don't know if I'd do it proper justice. Was it awkward at all when Bob and Genoa snatched the runner up trophy from you? Was the family, was there a family get together or anything like that was awkward or were you no, just like hey, happy for Bob? No, I'm, I'm happy for all Bob's successes. I've been in, in his corner from day one. I coached Bob. 
Um, Bob's a great kid, you know. Um, I love Bob. So, no, I mean, I'm, I was happy for him. I mean, uh, you know, we finished ahead of him in the dual meet that year. It was a great rivalry. We, we had a great match in the uh, regional duels where we were down 20 points and came back to beat them. Uh, we beat them in the districts, you know, sectionals. And at state, they wrestled very, very well. So you can only, you know, tip your hat to them and, and be happy for, for what they gained because their kids worked awfully hard too. Yeah, and then, and then Bob, I mean, he had the all-time great – he was the head coach of the all-time greatest Division three state team tournament ever. It's not up for debate. They broke every record at six champs. I want to say five in a row. It was incredible what they did. Jeez, oh, Pete, did they have six, were they all six in a row? Uh, I'm not sure. I think it was six in a row. Oh, my. Not, it was uh, unbelievable. Yeah, they had – yeah, I think it was six in a row. Oh, my gosh. Unless Lamanji won 170. He might have won 170 and not won 160. I, I forget what he won. I think he won think 170. Right. But – it's amazing. It was five out of six weights then, or six out of seven weights. And I mean, that is, it's unbelievable. Okay. If it's five in a row, that's amazing. Right. Did right. you guys, what did you win that one year, George? Did you win three out of four? No, I mean. Yeah, you did. You won, 50, you, won. you won 50, you won 52, you won 71, you won 89. Yeah. You won three right. out of four weights. Right. What's that like when you get a wave like that and a guy who got trucked by a guy a year earlier, Tank right. got his head ripped off by that guy the year earlier. Right. And the guy was trying to do it to him again. Tank ends up pinning him. You know, what was that like when you had three champs out of four weights at Furrow Carver with, with, uh, uh that was a dream. Was it? Tank with Magrum, right? Right. Right. Yeah. That was a dream. I mean, I was just one of those nights where everything fell into place and the hard training and everything just came to fruition. Yeah. And then you ran into the, opposite end of it when Ian was a senior <laughs> Did you have three runners up and a champ correct oh wow that's great. and the guy who was champ would have been the guy you could have never convinced me would have won that's what's amazing about what you've done George that's what is incredible what, Hackworth right Hackworth well if you'd have told me Ian Miller wouldn't win and Hackworth would I'd have laughed in your face and eaten my hat cut it up and eaten it you know I mean it's amazing, right? But your training's consistent. What you guys do is consistent. That's, I think, the biggest thing. I would, if there's a word for you, it's consistent. You're very consistently consistent. I mean, what, I, what, how does he break if, you? If you had one word for Zeb, what would it be? <laughs> you can't up. say that air. <laughs> oh, George. How does it's Tate all good. break you? How does Tate break you? I don't know how he does it. I think Tate breaks everyone. Yeah. I mean, he is, he is something. Tate else, is dude. persistent. I guess oh, it's... yeah. Persistent. Yeah. <laughs> Tate's been great though. He's been great. Been yeah, great. How, yeah. What's that like coaching the dad, like now the second and third generation guys, what's it like how, coaching them? How did Wyatt come from, from Tate, right? How'd that happen? <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Mutation. Uh, mutation. Yeah, mutation, there you yes. go. Right. Mutation happens. Yeah, how, how does that, what, what's that like though, George, when you, when you've coached the, you coach the dads, or I mean, have you coached the grandpas on some of them? Maybe I don't no. even know. No, he's, he's, the not, he's not that old, Zeb. Jeez, yeah, come on. but you've coached. You know, you're in your second generation of coaching guys. What's that like? You're coaching Tomer, right? You got Tomer. You got Dusa. right. I mean, you they're you treat them each individually, and they're they're all different. And then it's been so many years since you had them, so um, you know, you just you're coaching each kid individually. And they're definitely Atkinson. different. You got Atkinson. Right. That's crazy. And they're, I mean, that's just off the top of my head. You got Zeitzheim. Oh my God. That's, this is all on one team right now. Right. That's crazy. So you got a ton of, yeah. And you know, Craig Tomer, maybe one of the biggest freaks. That guy was a freak. Craig Tomer was incredible. He was really good. Like really good. Was he a two-time state placer for you guys, George? He, he plays third as a senior. Oh, I thought he placed maybe as a junior too. He didn't. No. Nope. He was in like a weight with like Janyasha Yats, I think. Oh, I think geez. actually Victor Voinovich, Victor's dad, Vic, the guy that was state champion in 89, Big Vic, we'll call him. He told me, he's like, yeah, Tomer was supposed to win my weight. And then Vic Voinovich ended up winning the weight. 
And that mm. was the year Lake Catholic won the team title. And now Chad, my brother Chad, beat the Judd Mintz guy in the final the semifinals. If Judd Mintz beats Chad, Kenston wins. Oh, wow. Did you know that? No. Yeah. So Kenston would have won. And my kids are going to go to Kenston. So, so Mintz didn't even have to beat the late Catholic guy. He could have just made the finals. I think it's an extra four points. Jared, is that what it is? It's something like that. Sounds about right. Yeah. So the extra four points would have pushed Kenston. Their lead would have been insurmountable. And then what happened was late Catholic had two guys lose or no, they had three finalists and the guy that was supposed to win, the guy Chad beat was like the only guy that was supposed to win. The two guys that weren't supposed to win won. Wow. That's how they ended up winning. Uh, Caprosi, the 60 pounder ended up winning it. And he was the only the 60 pounder because he couldn't beat the 52 pounder. Hmm. So just wild stuff, man. When you think about that, it's just, yeah, it's wild because yeah. And now Kenston's a massive division one school. It is- that Caprosi was, he was the one that, uh, maybe that was another year, but I was thinking Atkinson might've wrestled him. No, he did. He did. He wrestled okay. Caprosi. That's right. 89. Right. Atkinson was had four to one first period. And Caprosi came back and won, and Atkinson ended up third. Yeah, your guys' guy, your Catholic guy was on their side again. You guys got a lot with that that Catholic guy. He does good for wrestling. Your guy, your guys got it right. Your guy helps you guys out a lot. Stretch, St. Mary's, Lake Catholic, what are Eds? I don't know. Name a team. Name a team, and that's why they're pretty good. They got they got a, they got a pretty good person on their side. So um, that's okay though. Uh, What's the ultimate going out on top George Bergman story? Give me the sunset, fade into the sunset. What's the ultimate thing you'd like to do? Is there anything you want to do before you're done? Great question. Now I'll have to think of that. I got to get my bucket list in order. You know, I think the, the, one of the main things I want to, I'd like to have old Carver good, you know, 20 years from now. So to do that, I'd like to have, somebody in place that is young and, uh, you know, wants to, you know, be committed to the program and, and keep it going so that we can be talking to Carver wrestling 20 years from now. I, I, I wouldn't mind that. I wouldn't mind talking to Carver wrestling. I would really like talking Kenston wrestling 20 years <laughs> from now. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, no bombers. But I, I, I heard that you were going to move back to O'Carver. <laughs> You might have a natural gas leak in your house right now or something. <laughs> you might, you might, do you have the car running in the garage? Are you okay? You might be you, you and Tate are tight. Yeah, you, you and Tate are tight. I, I think that, that that dude's got that pipe dream. That dude's got that pipe dream. I'm not – man, I'll tell you what. If you came here, you'd be like, oh, I see why you live here now. It's like awesome. Jared, Jared can attest to it. Uh, my brother Troy is, just moved uh, like what five minutes down the road. Yeah, right? Troy lives on Bell. Troy lives right by my boy's daycare. Troy Opper lives a mile and a half. Okay, George. Troy Opper and George D. Camillo live a, about two miles from one another, and my kids' oh, daycare is wow. in between them. Oh, How about wow. that? How about that? It's just yeah, it's a really cool place out here. I really like it. It's kind of like a Western PA feel, Jared. Would you say? Yeah, kind of like yeah. rolling hills, little rolling hills, not like big gigantic hills. Right? How, how far are you from the stadium to watch the Browns game? Uh, so I went to the Ravens game. We Ubered home in 34 minutes. Oh, wow. Because wow. I so have 34. seats and tickets. You know, the, the longest 10 years of my life, George? The two What's years that? I was a Brown season ticket holder. <laughs> well, now I'm a Brown season ticket holder. And I can't wait. Well, you should. Yeah, you, you didn't because you didn't get one of them when I had them. I had them in like the <laughs> mid 2000s. It was brutal. I'll tell you yeah. what, though. I'll tell you what, though. The tailgate party was good. The tailgate <laughs> oh. party was where it was at. Oh, my goodness. Ryan Simmons had a bus. I, I was just going to ask. Simmons had to be there. I'm he had a bus because he had a bus. Right, right. Him it and, was crazy. Jerry, yeah. right? Yeah, him and Jerry, him and Corbin. It was Corbin. <laughs> uh, so, so you're a so you have to, you'll have to get the uh, the Browns fullback on there. He was a state champ. Janovich? Yeah. Andy Janovich was a state champ. I did not know that. Yep. In what state, George? That's where he might have me. I know he went to Nebraska. 
So I'm going to guess Nebraska, but I'm not positive. That's crazy. Well, Michigan State's quarterback was a state runner-up in Iowa. Yeah. He's a pretty – He's. I think he'll be a pro quarterback if you want the truth. I mean, you know, they're obviously not very good right now, but I think he's got a couple years left. Right. He has that a chance. That guy's pretty good. Right. Yeah, I mean, to see some of the guys who have wrestled, it's, it's crazy. Ray Lewis. Ray Lewis was, I think, a Florida State champ. Yep. I think he was two-timer. Yeah, right. Yeah. I think he was a couple time murderer too, but I mean, <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm being honest, you know, but Hey, Hey, he never got, uh, never got convicted. So I guess, Hey, him and OJ Simpson are doing something right. Good for those guys, I guess. Hey, the juice got, uh, he just got, uh, he just got vaccinated. Just so you guys know, he put oh, it on his Twitter. I've seen that guy keeps winning. Guy keeps winning. <laughs> Man has made a top line. And you know what? Even if that guy co- got COVID, it wouldn't even matter. The juice, nothing can get the juice. No, the DA, the district attorney, Los Angeles County can't get him. Nothing can get him. Oh, the Goldmans did get him. The, the Browns and Goldmans got him in a civil suit, but a lot of that, that's not even enforceable. They can't touch his pension or anything. So the juice is loose. So, all right, George, anything else for him? I don't any know. other good stories? Yeah, any, any other good old Carver stories, I guess. <laughs> I got to hear from Zeb Zang a lot of time. I don't know how true they yeah, are. Yeah, you know? come on. Right. Yeah. Zeb has a good memory. Yeah, it's I, I can't remember half the half – No, the, me either. I think I've been like, bounced off my head too many times. Yes. How about, how about how Scott Detray used to commit felonies against everyone? Scott Detray, I'm talking in a – he would have been charged with – 10 felonies of practice. Scott Detroit used to mop everybody up. George, it wasn't close. And then I remember he strangled a baseball no, player I, for I, sitting on the scale. Dude, this guy, I tell people this and they're like, no, that guy's like the nicest guy ever. What yeah, are you talking about? Right. He's like a jolly, he's like a jolly chubby guy. What do you mean? And I'm like, no, he was absolutely a psycho ex murderer. Yeah. He committed I remember telling of felonies. Tate, I told Tate after he won the state title, you need to go over and thank Scott, you know, because, I mean, Scott was probably one of the most responsible for his state win, you know, mm-hmm. being his crazy. partner. And, and it was weird because Scott cut to 130. 30. And 130 was, like, was brutal. Yeah, and it was like a really good weight. And then Tate I think he probably wins 130. Yeah, yeah, Tate went 35. I remember he threw me with like a key lock one time, and I landed on his elbow. And I thought I broke my sternum. I'm like, what? what's this guy doing? And he would just, like, maul us, dude. Like, just just beat us up really bad. Like, really, really, really bad. Like, I mean, I'm, this is not an exaggeration. He he kicked Tate's base in, too. Oh. It was Steve Avers. Name a guy. Oh, he beat I forgot Pat about Kenya. Yeah. yeah. He beat all these guys up. Was it wasn't guy. even a match. Tate and uh, Scott wasn't even a match. match it wasn't close. No. It wasn't like Scott D- Tate will tell you that. But like as George said, you know, you need teammates like that. Mm-hmm. That's right. 100%. You need teammates. Maybe a guy who doesn't perform under the pressure like you do. And then, you know, there's guys like that. Oh, there's room guys that are just amazing room guys. And then they get out in the arena and it's a different deal, man. It's, you it's see all every types year. of guys. And then yeah, there's different just, weight classes too. Scott's weight class is brutal. Yeah. That's Tate. Yeah, it was. It was a. Tough weight class, but yeah, Scott Detroit, what a tough guy. And and now a principal at Brexville. How about that? Yeah. I just, yeah, I love how many successful people you have, George, that you've had an impact on. That's yeah, that's Pat's that's principal at Norwalk. Norwalk. Yeah. Yeah. Last year, last year when Tate got thrown out of the SBC, Pat had to enforce that. <laughs> Part about Tate knew he's out. He just kept. Yeah. How about he's like, Tate's, Tate's, the athletic director comes out and he's like, "Hey man, you can't be in here." He goes, "I'm not going outside. You can call the cops. I work out in the cold and it sucks. I'm not going out there. You can call the cops. My wife's got the keys." And he he sat in the the cafeteria after he got kicked out after Wyatt lost to uh, Bays. And I kept going by and heckling him. I'm like, you got kicked out, you moron. It was awesome. Uh, couldn't have uh, to a better guy. <laughs> couldn't have to a better guy. Oh, God. Uh, it wasn't like the rep did anything wrong. It was like 
the stalemate calls of that first thing's a stalemate call in the overtime. It's like the ref made the right call. Right. Whatever. <laughs> oh, George, you are a saint, my friend. You are a saint indeed. So, all right. Oh, hey, George, George. Yeah. Just FYI, we are on the Barbarian Hour. You should be checking out barbarianapparel.com. Josh Sasky is our guy. Slash BA Hour. Slash BA Hour. You know, we got, we're going to have to get you some, we're going to have to get you a, a decal. We're going to have to get you some, maybe a Gohio. Listen, these are magnets. Okay. We got, I always I think I'd give you some defense soap. I hope oh, yeah. That. We'll get you some wipes. Guy gave me a couple, 10,000 of these, not quite that many, but these are amazing. Let me just tell you this right now. These are amazing. Um, but Jared, we got to get, got to give a shout out. Check out the custom hoodies. Yeah. The Ooh, BA Hour nice. hoodies. We got the BA Hour flag. Jared's got the logo hey, back there. Coach, have you seen? I, I got to, uh, they did, he did Stalemates gear. Have you seen Stalemates yet? Have you heard of this guy, Zach Bogle, Stalemates podcast? No, I haven't. Oh, he, Hold he, on. He, Let me yeah. tie it's all this together. Let it, me tie all this together. He's, he's what's wrestling has needed for a while. But, uh, George, did but, you coach any of the Castellas at Stretch? Castellas? Yeah. Did you coach any no. Castellas? Ray or no. uh, Ray no. Castellia? I mean, Jay, no. Ray and Jesse. Do you no. know who they are? They're from Genoa. Yes. You, right. I know. His mom, Zach Bogle's mom, is a Castellia. Okay. Did you hear that, Jared? Yeah, I remember you telling me or when you were yeah, on his show. Zach I remember Bogle, talking about the guy who he's like this parody guy and he works so, at Barbarian yeah. as so, well. So so Phil coach in on on who Zach Bo, you know, he's he's related okay. to him, but Phil meant So cause... Zach Bogle's mom and okay, so Ray Castellia has two sisters, Lori and Kathy, I believe. They moved to Iowa. I think they married I think maybe they married brothers or guys that were were friends or whatever. They both moved to Iowa and those guys work, I want to say for BP and they're like executives for BP. So they're out there in Iowa. And then one of, um, one of the ladies sons was a couple times state champ. He's actually the only guy ever to beat Jaden Cox in high school. Really? Uh, Mikey, yeah. Mikey Anglin, oh, wow. he's in the UFC now. He was a couple times time NCAA qualifier. One time I want to say for Iowa state and one time for Mizzou. He's in the UFC now. Mikey England is. And um, that is Zach's first cousin. Their moms are sisters, and their moms are Castellias. So there you go, George. Knowledge but, bombs. But George's but George's the Bergmans are from Genoa. Okay, but but George. So the stalemates guy. It, it's, it's this show. It's called Stalemates. It, he's he's hilarious. He, he's oh, he's pretty funny. Okay. So Zeb, you got to send Coach Coach send George come some of his best stuff, and you got to watch this guy. It's hilarious. It's. It's what's wrestling needed. It's kind of a parody account. He he breaks you know Twitter beefs down and yeah. What? How would you describe him? Zeb? How would you? He's just a real funny, creative guy. He's got like a real. He's really good at editing. Yeah. He's hilarious. He's innovative. He, he pushes the van. envelope. He van. Everything's I live. Was, he I makes up award van. shows. <laughs> it's parody. Yeah. It's comedy. He doesn't take himself too seriously. He's a good guy. You'd enjoy it. It's it's pretty common. And he's a barber. He's a barber in Des Moines, Iowa. Oh, okay. So, but he yeah, has he has really ties back to Northwest Ohio. But yeah, but. mom mom's a Genoa girl. So oh, okay, it might be Oregon or Genoa, wherever they they're from. But I think they're Genoa. But Barbarian Apparel does his his gear. And, but Zeb sent him sent him send him some links to check it out. But I'll, but thank, I'll bombard him with links, yeah. Coach Bergman. Thank you for the time, man. We appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah. You're a, a gentleman and a scholar, despite all the bad stuff I say about you behind your back. <laughs> you already know that's not true. I'd say it to your face. <laughs> all right. Thanks, well, Coach. Thanks for having me. It was yeah. fun. Yep. Awesome. I'll, I'll see you soon. Hello, wrestlers and coaches. I'm Teague Moore. I spent 20 years coaching at the Division I level in the NCAA, 15 of those years as a head coach. During that time, I helped a lot of wrestlers and parents navigate the recruiting process. I've now opened my own consulting business to do just that, to help you navigate the recruiting process. There's a lot of unanswered questions. How do scholarships work? What program would be right for my son? Or better yet, what coach would be right for my wrestler? 
I can help answer these and many other questions. Feel free to email me or call me at the information listed below and we can set up your first consultation today. I look forward to working with you and helping you make the right choice.